There is a new railway in Laos added to the transition network. In Mozambique, Africa's longest suspension bridge was erected. A seaport in Greece recently became the biggest across the Mediterranean. And Latin America saw its largest solar park start operation in Argentina. All of these transformative projects are part of a greater vision, China's Belt and Road Initiative. The plan spans over 140 countries, involves two-thirds of the world's population. It tells a story of globalization, a story of promoting growth in the global south in an inclusive and collaborative fashion. Every year, North America lavished three times the electricity use of Sri Lanka on crypto mining. But in Africa, 600 million people still have no access to electrical lighting. As globalization proceeds, a fault line stands out. Emerging economies are in dire need of infrastructure investment. 66 trillion US dollars by 2030, to be exact. However, this huge void attracts little attention. In 2017, the United States spent a meager 3.8% of its foreign aid budget on infrastructure. In 2020, Western firms were directly responsible for 12% of the construction projects on the continent, a substantial decline from the 1990s. So the infrastructure gap is widening, and so is the divide of the global wealth. Bad as it sounds, the outlook is not all bleak. In 2013, Chinese President Xi Jinping proposed what later known to be the Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, during his visit to Kazakhstan and Indonesia. By then, Kazakhstan, the world's largest landlocked nation, just finished its first highway. But eight years into the BRI drive, its highway system stretches to over 10,000 kilometers, and 80% of China-Europe Railway Express pass through Kazakhstan, making the Central Asian country an Atlantic to Pacific transit hub. The place where BRI made its debut offers a glimpse of how this plan unties the Gordian knot in developing countries. It is a patient investing, and one that induces changes. In Kenya, BRI helped fund its first standard gauge railway since the country's independence, trailblazing an expansive trans-African transport network. In Pakistan, BRI investment raised the country's electricity capacity by 60% in three years, making regular 10-hour power outage history. And according to British sociologist Martin Albro, the demand for these initiatives arises also out of the felt needs of the people in their local environments with their distinct cultural heritages. By 2020, the value of the Belt and Road projects reached 4.3 trillion US dollars. This ambitious collaborative plan is set to help reorient the developing countries in the global division of labor. But this is not a change that pleases everyone. China has its Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and we think that there's a much more equitable way to provide for the needs of countries around the world. When it comes to BRI bashing, Biden has an unlikely like-minded. China uses so-called debt diplomacy to expand its influence. Just ask Sri Lanka, which took on a massive debt to let Chinese state companies build a port of questionable commercial value. And they have asked again and again how a BRI port project has debt trapped Sri Lanka into surrendering this port to China, as if it is really what happened. But is it really what happened? A John Hopkins study finds that China accounts for only 10% of the country's foreign debt, behind international financial market, the Asian Development Bank, and Japan. Not to mention 60% of China's loan was concessional. And according to IMF and Sri Lanka Central Bank, it was exactly the borrowing from international financial markets that became the problem. Selling shares of Hanbin Toda port to China is the solution. We are also seeing Sri Lanka's debt being now, uh, to, to a great extent, being helped out by China. So it's not a debt trap that we are in with China. We have commercial transactions with them. But still, the muscling against Belt and Road projects presses on. The PRC has been criticized for loading poor countries up with debt, as it did with, Sri Lanka, with the Sri Lankan port of Hambantota in 
2017. This is little more than a form of modern day colonialism. Despite the nonsensical twaddle about the port, Mr. Former Attorney General regurgitated another concept integral to the BRI smear campaign, modern day colonialism or neo-colonialism. This is a term made known to the world by the vanguard of Pan-Africanism Kwame Nkrumah. It refers to a post-colonial institution that allows the West to keep siphoning off wealth from former colonies. And that's when Nkrumah gave an example of how this institution works. Unlike BRI's focus on infrastructure building, 66% of American direct investment in Africa today still goes to the mining sector. In fact, top 10 mining companies on the continent are all based in the West, and three of them the United States. Mostly through these extractive industries, over 50 billion US dollars illegally flow from the poorest continent to the richest nations every year. It accounts for 5.7% of Africa's GDP, yet even such predatory investment often came with a price. The strings attached come in the form of control. We, we experience that. If, even cross the line and want to govern your country. Sometimes they even want to choose who should be the leader of that country. This is not from China. I'm talking about uh, <laughs> now the other people who <laughs> seem to say they do things right. Of all the US-backed regime changes in Africa, the one that happened in Ghana overthrew Nkrumah, one year after his book, New Colonialism, was published. Decades later, the system that Nkrumah was up against is still there, and a behemoth military presence makes sure the system persists. A secure, prosperous, and self-reliant Africa is in the national interest of the United States. The West tends to project its own colonial mentality onto China, but obviously, BRI has taken a different path. In the past two decades, 63% of Chinese loans to Africa went to transport, communication, and electricity. These capitals were transformed into 30,000 kilometers of railway and highway, 80 power plants, and 160,000 local skilled workforce. Our partnership with China is not a partnership based on China telling us what we need. It is a partnership of friends working together to meet Kenya's social economic agenda. Perhaps that is why some people feel threatened by the BRI. Because this partnership offers a new paradigm that breaks free with a new colonialist yuk and a vicious cycle of underdevelopment. With the 500 billion US dollars worth of annual industrial production in Africa, Chinese ventures helped contribute 12%. This is an industrialization long overdue, and it is happening all across the developing world. And BRI is not a one-way street. It helps China expand tree links with more accessible foreign partners and vitalize its own less developed regions through growing interconnectivity. In the meantime, BRI aims to forge a massive transport network, knit together global markets, and help lift millions of people out of poverty. In many ways, the Belt and Road Initiative is changing the world, and more importantly, it is changing the way globalization unfolds. The grand vision to build global growth engines for those who fell through the cracks is put to practice. And maybe that is how globalization is supposed to look like.